It is 4.30 in the morning and as much as I would love to lay down on the floor and close my eyes with the lights on and everything, regardless, I am super excited to answer the question whether you should opt for the MacBook Air or upgrade to the MacBook Pro because since both have the M1 chip, it seems like the MacBook Pro is now obsolete. Like, why would you buy it? But it turns out there are reasons why you should. So we will talk about that in this video and of course talk about reasons why you should just stick with the cheaper MacBook Air, which once again has the same processor. But anyway, before we jump into this in-depth test here, I would appreciate it if you'd leave a like on this video. I'm burning the midnight oil here, come on. Uh, leave a comment if you have any questions, suggestions, or opinions. And of course, uh, if you are subscribed, click the bell icon as it does help the channel out a lot. So we got the baseline cheapest new M1 MacBook Air on the left here and the cheapest baseline M1 MacBook Pro 13 inch on the right. And both are pretty much identically specced, of course, with the M1 chip, eight gigs of unified RAM and 256 gigs of internal storage. Uh, thank God Apple rid of 128 gigs when I was trying to upgrade my uh, MacBook Pro with that amount of storage, it was a nightmare. But anyway, um, the only spec difference or notable spec difference between these two laptops is with the number of GPU cores. I believe Apple has two batches of the M1 chip, one that is more successful and that's like more of them, and a couple that are less successful, um, ones where they can't enable every GPU core. So they put this process or these sort of screw ups into the cheaper MacBook Air, which gives you pretty much the same CPU performance, but a little bit lesser GPU performance, uh, whereas they put the better M1 chips in the rest of the Mac lineup, including the higher spec MacBook Air, all the MacBook Pro models, and the Mac Mini models as well. And we'll see uh, where this uh, makes a difference in terms of performance and benchmarks here. But other than that, once again, the specs between these two laptops are pretty much identical. Um, but what's not identical is some of their physical attributes and features. Uh, for one, the MacBook Pro has the touch bar. This is a pretty nice feature to look at. Although I think in practice or in like a usage case, it's not like a deal breaker. It's not a reason to buy the MacBook Pro over the MacBook Air in my opinion. I like it, it's cool, but it doesn't add much function other than you know like scrolling through emojis and having some custom menu items or tools or whatever. But to each his own or her own, you know, if you like that, then buy it. But I don't think it's worth paying more over the air for, especially if you're just looking for, you know, a device to get you through everyday tasks and some heavier ended stuff as well. Um, the speakers are also pretty similar. I was doing some listening and I'll do a little test for you in a minute here. But yeah, I mean, I tried my hardest to, you know, hear a difference and I really couldn't. I think the MacBook Pro might be a tad bit better, but the drivers in both are really excellent. <laughs> Both have Touch ID as well, which works identically. You know, it's great for unlocking your system and just getting in and making purchases securely and stuff like that. So no difference there. And uh, kind of going back to the touch bar or the lack thereof with the MacBook Air, I actually like the function buttons. I miss that. And I like being able to just, you know, mash the, you know, volume keys when I'm like in a Zoom call and it's too loud or something. I don't have to like think about swiping or sliding, but that is just me once again. These laptops also have fantastic glass track pads with force touch. That's been a feature for a few years. And I think they're identical in size. I really can't tell the difference. And then the keyboards are great as well. They're magic or Apple calls them their magic keyboards. They're very flat, but they do have some travel unlike the previous disgusting butterfly keys that I have honestly gotten used to with my 2019 MacBook Pro, but these keyboards are so much better and you're gonna enjoy your typing experience with both. Um, although the typing experience is a bit different on both because of the sort of angle or the body of these MacBooks. And that's sort of the last point I'll make here, um, or one of them, actually I have one more point to make after this, but the body of the MacBook Air is a bit more wedge shaped. That's been a thing since 2008 and overall it's lighter. So there's more of an incline or a slight incline for your wrist when you're typing. Whereas with the MacBook Pro, it's flat, it's thicker, and this accommodates a better battery. So that's another thing I'll bring up too. Um, we'll move on from there. The battery life is gonna be a bit better with the uh, MacBook Pro as well. It's a bit thicker, it accommodates a bigger battery, so you get like one or two hours more, which can make a difference if you're on the road, so keep that in mind as well. 
And the last difference I will mention is with brightness. I believe the MacBook Pro has a 100 nit brighter display, sort of like the iPhone 12 Pro does over the iPhone 12 and like the Pro phones in general just sort of an analogy, but yeah, the pro display is gonna be a bit brighter, a bit more oriented towards creative work, but I think both are beautiful for that because they're equally colorful and equally bright in most situations, but of course you can push the MacBook Pro screen a bit more here. Um, but with that out of the way, now let's talk about performance here. And I know a lot of people are gonna to wanna to buy these baseline MacBook Pros because they're really compelling even at their baseline standard. I mean, you don't need to buy all the internal storage in the world. You can just buy a T5 SSD. External storage is great. And I was copying over some video files and it's been really, really fast. So I'm very happy with that as well. But we're gonna open up some Geekbench tests that I did here. And if you look at the results here, um, they are really different. And in fact, this morning I did a test with these laptops and my MacBook Air scored a bit higher than my Pro. So it's all situational. You know, it's always like plus or minus uh, one to like 15 points points or whatever, but yeah, both score above 1700 in single core scores and above 7600 in multi-core scores. This is Core i7 territory, almost Core i9 territory in my iMac 5K, which is just nuts. And I honestly might replace my iMac 5K with the MacBook Pro so I can sell my iMac while it's still worth something because I can't imagine what the brand new iMac is going to bring um, in terms of design and performance, but we'll talk about that later in a different video here. Um, but where scores differ a little bit is with the OpenCL test or the compute test within Geekbench. So here we have the OpenCL compute results within Geekbench 5, and this test is designed to tax or to use the GPUs within your chip. And yeah, the seven core aspect is sort of shining through here. We get a score of 16,449 compared to a score of 19,445. So a difference of 3000 points. And it seems like that extra core in the M1 variant within the MacBook Pro does make a difference. So this might make a bit of a difference when you're rendering video, when you're playing a game, you know, maybe not a huge difference, but I mean like 3000 points seems to be substantial enough. I mean, the M1 chip is powerful as it is far more powerful than the i3 processor found in the previous baseline MacBook Air. And if you wanna see that difference demonstrated, I recommend you watch my last video. It's really insane. But yeah, um, this is where the seven core GPU sort of um, brings the baseline MacBook Air a little bit behind in terms of synthetic benchmarks. But of course, we will do some real world testing to see if it makes that much of a difference here. And I'll probably be doing a different video going over some gaming results or gaming like playing Minecraft and some Steam games. If you want that, let me know. But having shown Geekbench scores, next up I wanna open another synthetic benchmark app. Not because I wanna see how well these laptops perform, because I know they're gonna perform very similarly because this is a CPU-oriented test. I rather want to run it for like 15 to 30 minutes just to see um, if they keep up with each other and if the MacBook Air will thermal throttle. And that was an issue with the previous Intel versions, but the question is, is that an issue with the M1 variant here? Especially because I believe there's no fan in the MacBook Air compared to the MacBook Pro, which has a fan that will kick on. Um, rarely I heard from other people's testing, but we will see how that works here. So I'm gonna open up Cinebench on both of these laptops here, and we're gonna run this for a while and see once again if they keep up with each other. So I'm gonna start a multi-core test and I'm probably gonna turn off my camera here so it doesn't overheat, and then I'm gonna come back in like 25 minutes to see if they are on the same page. So three, two, one, start. All right, so I will be back. Okay, so the test concluded before the 25 minute mark, about halfway through actually. And for some reason, I thought I could perpetually run this test to see if the fan would kick on and to see if one laptop would overtake the other in terms of passes. And that's exactly what happened actually. Although I didn't catch it on camera, the MacBook Pro slowly gained on the MacBook Air. It's sort of like if someone's running at like 4.75 miles an hour and the other person racing them is running at five miles an hour. Although the race might look close at first, you know, after some time, the person running a bit faster is gonna get farther and farther ahead and there's gonna be more and more of a performance gap. And that's what happened here. Although it's not huge, the MacBook Air ended up having a multi-core score of around 6850, whereas the MacBook Pro had a multi-core score around 7750. And keep in mind, this is a CPU test. I just read on Google, Cinebench does not test the GPU. It purely taxes or tests the CPU. So although the Geekbench scores were the same and sometimes a little bit better with the MacBook Air because of Geekbench's ambiguity, 
Beauty. It seems like the thermal dynamics, the thermal design of the MacBook Pro are superior to that of the MacBook Air. I mean, it's thicker, it has an actual fan, and although I didn't hear it kick on, I'm sure maybe at some point it came on and kept the CPU a bit cooler and running at a higher clock speed. And this is where I think the MacBook Pro pulls ahead of the MacBook Air, just like with the previous gen Intel models, although um, the gap is slimmer now, thank God. I mean, the MacBook Air with the i3 and the i5 that we saw earlier this year, I mean, the thermal performance was just really bad and the processor was very much handicapped because of that. But with this, I mean, it's just a slight disadvantage. But I will say, if you are rendering video for hours on end, like I am, if you're sitting there, you know, playing through 4K stuff and just constantly taxing your CPU, having the fan in there and having a better thermal design is going to make a difference, especially if you are rendering video or, you know, just doing this kind of stuff every day. I mean, these precious seconds add up and if time is money, then I think the Pro really is the professional model to go with. But having ran some synthetic benchmark tests, which of course are important and reflective of what you can expect out of these laptops, now I'm gonna run some real world performance tests here. And no, I'm not gonna do anything super basic because I know for a fact both these laptops are gonna perform pretty much identically within a margin of error in terms of like web surfing and opening apps. Like I'll open up Spotify here, I mean look, pretty much the same. The MacBook Air actually opened it a bit quicker. So there you go. I mean, in terms of everyday tasks, like stuff that you would do as a student, as a writer, you know, web surfing, basic stuff, it's gonna be the same. So there's no point in going over that. However, there is a point in going over some stuff that does tax your CPU, like video editing. So we're first gonna start out with Final Cut Pro, which is an application that I use every day for my work here. And I already created a 4K project, and I also have some files that I wanna import here. So I'm gonna drag and drop them at the same time. So three, two, one. So a tiny bit quicker with the MacBook Pro, but once again, that might be within a margin of error here. Both were pretty much instantaneous. And of course they are on local storage, so it's really quick to do that as well. And uh, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna synchronize audio and video. Um, and this is something that, oh Jesus Christ, I'm in my apartment alone at three in the morning and I heard a voice and it just scared me. All right, so let's synchronize the clips here. Three, two, one. Oh, gotta click okay. So three, two, one. Same thing, same performance, no difference at all. So here we go, the waveforms were synced up, the audio and video is matched, and again, that happened instantaneously, so no difference in performance there, and I can play this back, as you can see here, at the same time, no problem, full resolution here. Let's actually check that. I'll go to view, and we can go to better quality, and I don't think it's gonna change anything at all, so we'll make sure both are at better quality. And as you can see, there are no missed frames. I mean, everything is perfect because both of these chips are the same. They're gonna perform similarly, but of course, during prolonged, you know, like rendering times when you're really taxing your CPU, perhaps the MacBook Pro might surpass the MacBook Air. And we'll see if that actually comes to fruition here outside of a benchmark test. So I'm gonna like, you know, start editing some clips here identically on both, and then we're gonna render this project to see which one, you know, happens to finish first. And before I do the whole render test, I actually wanna do a quick stabilization test with this handheld shot that I took at 4K, so I'll click stabilize. It should render it out, and as you can see, yeah, it happened at the same time, there's no difference. So in terms of like little shifts and adjustments, I mean, of course, I'm just stabilizing a shorter clip, you know, of course, maybe longer clips might render a bit faster on the MacBook Pro, but I mean, for the work that I'm doing, not noticing that much of a difference. Oh, and here's a great I usually do, I'll just sort of like maybe tone down highlights and mid-tones and then boost some of the blues and the shadows. I need to stop boosting the yellows and the highlights because some people are like, why are your video so yellow, dude? And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm going to copy this over here and I'm going to paste that as well. So we have that applied here. I also do some retiming as well at like 80%. I like to have some of my B-roll play at 24 frames a second. So I will apply that over here as well and also do a similar grade on my Air too. So I'm having a bit of stuttering with the MacBook Air. That's interesting. I'm gonna do the same thing that I just did um, with my Pro here and I'm going to copy and paste some of the grades that I did. I'm gonna drag this over here as well. Okay, so beach ball of death, that's interesting. Um, maybe that's just a isolated incident, but we're all fine and well 
over here with the MacBook Pro, so. Hmm. Now, don't take this as like, oh, the air is worse. This is probably just a one-off thing. I might have to just force quit the application. I mean, sometimes I get error things happening with my iMac 5K, so it happens to the best of us, so don't prejudge the MacBook Air here just because of this one incident. But if this is a recurring thing, then maybe that's something noteworthy. So I'm gonna force quit this and reopen it because for whatever reason, this app is not responding. So I caught up with the MacBook Air, no problem. I think Final Cut was just acting weird with it, so I wouldn't worry too much. And now I'm gonna wait for the background render to complete, and then we're gonna do the render test to see which laptop will render the entire project first. Okay, so I think I'm about ready to hit render here. I am rendering at H.264. The file size should be around uh, 9.6 gigs, and I guess all that's left to say is may the best MacBook win. Okay, so this is why I'm glad we did a longer render test. So the MacBook Air just finished here and I'm gonna stop. So the MacBook Pro rendered a nearly 19 minute 4K clip in 12 minutes and 37 seconds, whereas the MacBook Air here just finished a minute and 49 seconds behind. So overall, it took the MacBook Air 14 minutes and 27 seconds. So nearly two minutes longer. And this is significant, especially because these laptops have the same chip. And yes, while I believe an extra GPU core might make a difference, I still believe that the MacBook Pro is still gonna pull ahead of the MacBook Air simply because it is more thermally sound, it has a fan, and it's gonna keep that processor running at a higher clock speed throughout you know, rendering, throughout heavy usage. So there you go, I mean, very impressive performance with both. I mean, if you're into thin and light and you don't want a fan, you want your device to be completely silent, then the MacBook Air might be worth it to you. And I mean, I don't usually render anything longer than 20 minutes anyway, or if I do, it's very rare. So I could definitely live with the MacBook Air, although I do like the increased performance with the MacBook Pro. So keep that in mind, you know. So two minutes saved over time can be substantial, I think, here. But again, both of these laptops have proven to be really excellent in terms of video editing and rendering. So with video editing out of the way, now I wanna open up another app that's vital to a lot of our creative workflows, and that is Photoshop, the Intel version, by the way. This is not the Apple Silicon-based version. Um, so we're gonna open up a PSD file on both here. And maybe I clicked a bit slower on the MacBook Air, but it opened up first on the MacBook Pro. And I was also screwing up opening um, this application on my MacBook Air multiple times. So I'm gonna just open this up again um, just to see if there's any difference. So we'll do this one more time. So both are opening up here roughly at the same time. So I think that I had preloaded this app into the RAM because I kept opening this and not opening this at the same time, like I kept screwing up. So as you can see here, opening these apps up is pretty similar. So here we are in Photoshop, I can disable and enable layers and it's pretty much instantaneous in terms of manipulating stuff around. I can, for example, drag this title around here like so. There we go, I can drag it around over here as well. No delay there. Um, I can maybe, I don't know, do some perspective warp. Not that you really want to with a title, but sure, why not? We can do it over here. I use this all the time to, um, what's it called, superimpose screens. So, you know, we can do that like so and click the check mark. We can also do it over here. Perspective warp, do it right here warp it out and like there's no delay. And this is, you know, I've had trouble with this on like an older Intel based MacBook from like 2014, but there you go. I mean like within Photoshop, you're not gonna see too much of a difference. I mean, maybe if you have like multiple layers, maybe extra RAM will benefit me. Maybe the thermal dynamics of the MacBook Pro might come in handy in one particular workflow, but since Photoshop is more or less of a CPU intensive task, I shouldn't, or you shouldn't really notice a difference between the two. I mean, like you're not using every core, you're not putting your CPU under intense load for long durations. It's sort of spurts of, um, I guess, you know, usage throughout if you're doing some perspective warp or if you're doing some sharpening or whatever. From what I've noticed, I can't discern a difference. So if you're doing just Photoshop or photo manipulation with a Lightroom, for example, which we'll end this video with, I really wouldn't buy the MacBook Pro over that unless you want the brighter display and whatever or the touch bar, which does you know make use of some Photoshop functions. But as you can see here, if we click on these um, uh, photos here that I edited in Lightroom, especially since they're 720p. I mean, if you like toggle the edits on and off, like they're very minimal. So we can make some adjustments here with exposure. As you can see, there's no delay with either because once again, this is more of a single core oriented task and both perform the same and this is not a CPU intensive task. So we can do something else here. How about we adjust temperature? We can do the same thing over here, make it blue. I know I'm making this look awful, but I'm just demonstrating what you can expect in terms of the 
um, performance or the responsiveness within this application. And then we can, you know, crank up sharpening all the way to the max here and make it look really deep fried. And there you go. I mean, the experience is no different. And we can also export this photo as well. Export. And it did it at the same time. So yeah, I mean, with photo editing and stuff of the like, I mean, there are similar applications that have similar like usage of the CPU. You're not gonna notice too much of a difference, but when it comes to long drawn out, you know, like high intensive tasks, like video editing or rendering, or, you know, if you're doing 3D modeling or whatever with whatever software you'd use within the MacBook Pro or MacBook Air. So to put things really, really simply, if you're somebody who does a mixture of heavier ended tasks, some creative stuff, and also, you know, basic stuff like student document typing and web surfing or whatever, then the MacBook Air is a fantastic device, better than ever for that, and you're gonna get great battery life and great performance regardless. Um, whereas if you're doing more creative stuff and some basic stuff, I would say go for the MacBook Pro, you're gonna get better rendering times. However, if you're doing photo editing, you might wanna consider the MacBook Air and invest $300 elsewhere, maybe in a camera, maybe in a lens. Um, so I would say, yeah, if you're doing stuff that requires intense CPU usage all the time like I am, I'd go with the MacBook Pro, and if you want the better display as well, then go for that too. And if you like the touch bar, and if you like a bit better battery life, then of course, consider the Pro as well. I know I mentioned that before, but yeah, this concludes this really in-depth test. Um, I've been recording for the past two hours, and I can't wait to see how late I stay up editing this video. It is 4.23 a.m., so hopefully I can go to bed before <laughs> 8 a.m. here or something like that. And that about wraps things up here. I hope this video was helpful. I thought it was crucial to answer this question for you guys, especially as Black Friday is coming up. And I know a lot of people are interested in these new Macs because of this new really impressive hardware. So consider everything I said and you know make the best informed purchasing decision. Hopefully I have helped you there. But anyway, I'd appreciate it once again if you leave a like on this video, of course, if you want to, no one's forcing you. Leave a comment and of course, subscribe for more content like this. I have a lot more MacBook oriented content coming soon. I'm probably gonna be replacing my iMac 5 5K with a spec'd out a 13 inch MacBook Pro. So that should be interesting here. And uh, yeah, other than that, I'm Noah and I will catch you all in the next one.